<clears throat> okay, uh, hello. Um, uh, today is the 18th of May, 2023. And uh, today there are 140 years since the birth of Walter Gropius, who among many other things was the founder <clears throat> of Bauhaus, the celebrated uh, art architecture design school. Before I begin to talk about Walter Gropius and his um, many accomplishments, I would like though to talk first about the Bauhaus, because I think the Bauhaus was the greatest achievement of Walter Gropius, in my opinion. He built many buildings, uh, he had a rich activity, but in my opinion, his um, most uh, astonishing uh, accomplishment was and is the Bauhaus. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this formidable uh, school almost an anti-school. It was born in 1919, and it lasted for only 14 years. And in 1933, uh, it, uh, it vanished. Uh, well, it, it, you know, some, some of the professors of the Bauhaus uh, crossed the ocean, went to the United States. There was also a, a Bauhaus opened in Ulm in Germany, but the Bauhaus, the German Bauhaus had was active only between 1919 and uh, 1933. Uh, but in these 14 years, they changed the world, if, if we can say so. We'll begin by talking a little bit about the Bauhaus, the very beginning of the Bauhaus at Weimar, because that's where it started in Weimar. So the, the Bauhaus in Weimar lasted from 1919 to 1925. So approximately uh, 100 years ago. This was the building where the Bauhaus was located in Weimar, and it was designed by uh, Van der Velde, um, not by Gropius. Gropius designed the campus in Dessau, the next period in the evolution of the Bauhaus. Now, I, I understand that uh, the buildings by uh, Walter Gropius in Dessau are very appreciated for the modernistic ethos. But to be honest with you, if I compare the building, the old building in Weimar built by Van der Velde and the buildings by Walter Gropius, I'm not so sure that it's truly, you know, uh, uh, progress. I mean, these older buildings in Weimar have their own, uh, you know, charm, and uh, it's a different kind of architecture. But um, maybe my retrograde side uh, is inclined to say that uh, architecturally, it's not, uh, it's not less significant. So this is where the the, the Bauhaus started in Weimar, uh, and not in Dessau in 1919. This is the building where the Bauhaus started. And again, it was designed by Van der Velde and not by uh, Walter Gropius. And this was the manifesto uh, that uh, Walter Gropius wrote in 1919. And uh, the illustration, the graphic, the woodcut on the left belonged to a professor at the Bauhaus, invited by Walter Gropius, the only North American at that time, um, Lionel Feininger. And, and uh, the woodcut on the left represents nothing else than, as, as they called it, the Cathedral of Socialism. So in, it is my opinion that at the beginning, the Bauhaus had a very strong spiritual um, element, and uh, it had even mystical overtones or undertones. And this very short manifesto, I hope I have it translated in English, yes. Let's read it because it's very important. This was the scene from which the Bauhaus grew. And it was written by Walter Gropius in 1919. So 100 uh, four years ago. The ultimate aim of all creative activity is a building. The decoration of buildings was once the noblest function of fine arts, and fine arts were indispensable to great architecture. 
Today they exist in complacent isolation and can only be rescued by the conscious cooperation and collaboration of all craftsmen. Architects, painters, sculptors once again come to know and comprehend the composite character of a building, both as an entity and in terms of its various parts. Then the work will be filled with that true El architectonic spirit, which, as I call Salon Art, it has lost. The old art schools were unable to produce this unity between the arts. And how indeed should they have done so since art cannot be taught? Schools must return to the workshop, the world of the pattern designer and applied artist consisting only of drawing and painting must become once again a world in which things are built. If the young person who rejoices in creative activity now begins his career as in the older days, by learning a craft, then the unproductive so-called artist will no longer be condemned to inadequate artistry for his skills will be preserved for the crafts in which he can achieve great things. Architects, painters, sculptors, we must all return to crafts for there is no such thing as so-called professional art. There is no essential difference between the artist and the craftsman. The, the artist is an exalted craftsman by the grace of heaven and in rare moments of inspiration which transcend the will, art may unconsciously blossom from the labor of his hand, but a base in handicrafts is essential to every artist. It is there that the original source of creativity lies. Let us therefore create a new guild of craftsmen without the class distinctions that raise an arrogant barrier between craftsmen and artists. Let us desire, conceive and create the new building of the future. Together, it will combine architecture, sculpture and painting in a single form and will one day rise towards the heavens from the hands of a million workers as the crystalline symbol of a new and coming faith. Walter Gropius, 1919. Now this is, a, this is an exalted and exalting little writing, you know, a small uh, text, but full of intensity and it's clearly advocating something that, that transcends materialism and utilitarianism. In fact, you know, it's not an accident that the last word of the manifesto is faith. And uh, he talks about, uh, you know, by the grace of heaven. Now, this is not the language of an utilitarian uh, man or spirit at all. And uh, so I think this manifesto written in 1919 by Walter Gropius is immensely important if we are to understand what Walter Gropius searched for at that time when the Bauhaus was founded. And, uh, you know, it's also clear that uh, he tried to bring together the arts, painting, sculpture, architecture, and, they, and, and that he, he, he considered the architect an artist, an exalted artist. And this is why, you know, he invited as, as professors, as masters in the school at the beginning, mainly artists. They were all artists, actually. There was no architect there with, his, with the exception of himself. But let's move forward. This was the 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 logo of the of the school designed by Oscar Schlemmer, a remarkable artist himself, and we'll talk a, a little bit about him in 1919 Bauhaus at the Weimar uh, location. Uh, they had various uh, you know uh, approximation graphic approximations of what they tried to convey through uh, you know this newly born uh, uh, school again designed by uh, Oscar Schlemmer, an artist I admire a lot. Uh, 
I even try to challenge some, not to challenge, to, I found inspiration in the Bauhaus so much because I love the Bauhaus that I try to create, to emulate myself with their example. So I, 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 I created a small art gallery studio in Evanston, Chicago, and you can see it's called the Carch, was called the Carch, Art and Architecture. But only afterwards I realized that it, in fact, the, without doing it consciously, I realized that I was influenced by Oscar Schlemmer and the, you know, the, the logo of, of, of the Bauhaus. And this was my little, I was even living there because I didn't have money for, uh, you know, to rent another place. Anyway, I did this installation on the, on the windows of my gallery on, on Easter. And I don't know, I think it's written there in 2004 or 2005. Anyway, moving forward, this was an exhibition I did with the skyscraper designs and so on. Anyway, moving forward, we come back to, to the Bauhaus, the, the real Bauhaus, the one from 1919 onwards. And here we see the, the curriculum in, in a way, you know, it was circular. It was not rectangular. This makes a whole difference because it was a vision. It was a vision and it was colored not by utilitarianism, but it was, it was colored by a, by a vision. So, you know, what do you see here? You know, elementary study of form, study of materials in the basic workshop. It was not based, based just on drawing as a, as a basic course. Then we move towards the center, study of materials and tools, study of nature, study of materials again, space study, color study, composition study, study of construction and uh, uh, representation, and then come closer, even closer to the center, the materials, clay, stone, wood, metal, textiles, color, and glass. And at the center, building site, testing design, building an engineer, engineering site at the center. Uh, now, in 1925, uh, the Bauhaus moved from Weimar to Dessau, where Walter Gropius built um, the buildings in the campus, and we are going to see, see them. So in Dessau, it's, it lasted from 1925 to 1932, for seven years. Uh, this is a very moving picture, because it's, it's, uh, they are the masters of the Bauhaus, uh, on the roof, on the terrace of a building in Tessau, in Tessau, I mean, the school. I recognize some of them. This is Walter Gropius here. This is Marcel Breuer, a remarkable architect and designer, a protege in a way of Gropius. And Gropius took him, took Marcel Breuer with him to the United States. Here is the great um, the Russian uh, painter uh, Vasily Kandinsky, here is his friend, the equally great uh, Swiss uh, painter, a great uh, poet painter, Paul Klee. This is Lionel Feininger, the, the North American uh, master in the school who, was, uh, who did that uh, woodcut uh, of the manifesto. Um, here is uh, the only lady uh, who was actually the master of the textile, um, uh, textile uh, department in the school, and she's the only one, Günther Stolz, uh, who took her hat off. All the men, as you can see, are with the hats on, but the lady took her let hat off. This is perhaps something to think about. Here is um, uh, Moholinogi, also a very important artist. Uh, do I recognize some others? Uh, not so precisely. So I bet, uh, so I named a few of the important, but they were all important. But this, this, um, this picture moves me, always moved me, you know, because these people again, and this must be stressed, this must be underlined, they wanted to change the world. Nothing less. They wanted to change the world. And I wonder how many of us have the same desire. How many of us want to contribute to culture, to architecture, to painting, to sculpture, to photography, to textile work in such a creative way that uh, they achieve uh, 
exuberance and that they achieve uh, exaltation, that exaltation that transforms the craftsman into an artist, exactly like Walter Gropius uh, envisioned. I think if we don't have this desire to change not just the world, but ourselves in the process of becoming better, in, in the process of, uh, you know, uh, exalting ourselves with a very creative work, how could we aspire to do great things? Maybe, maybe some people would say, wait a minute, greatness means arrogance. Not necessarily. It depends what kind of greatness. I'm not talking about financial greatness. I'm talking about creative greatness. To do great things in your field, whatever that field might be, but not, but not the financial one. These were the buildings designed by Walter Gropius in Dessau. So we remember uh, they moved to Dessau from Weimar in 1925. Uh, this is how they are today. Now, what is perhaps strange is that when you look at these buildings, you don't actually see that unity of the arts. I mean, where is the painting here? Where is the sculpture? There is just the architecture. The envelope, the architectonic envelope, is just by itself. In a, in a bizarre way, perhaps, the first building designed by Van der Velde, Henry Van der Velde, um, united more the arts than actually the building um, or the buildings designed by Walter Gropius, which are very close to what we call to the, today international style, you know, orthodox modernism in its whiteness and clarity of thought uh, and design. Now, some housing, uh, there are important buildings were designed for the masters, meaning the professors, the master ho master's houses, uh, you know, for Walter Gropius, for Paul Klee, for Vasily Kandinsky. Uh, they lived uh, very well, uh, and uh, obviously they had the funds to build uh, to build such buildings. Uh, the students didn't live so uh, uh, <laughs> opulently as the masters, and this might be a little bit problematic when we think about it, because this was supposed to be a school of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, a democratic school. And, uh, you know, these masters were doing quite well uh, compared to the students. But the students were happy, didn't protest. And the setting was beautiful, you know, in the forest. Uh, so these are the houses of the masters, of the professors. And now the student houses were different, you know, block of flats. What can we do? But the, the atmosphere in the school was great because it was very unconventional, was free. And it is my uh, claim that uh, actually the uh, part of the seduction of Bauhaus is because they knew how to unite work with play. And uh, there are many pictures showing this. I hope I have some here, I hope. But, uh, you know, in, in the graphic arts as well, you know, this is from 1923 when the Bauhaus was still in Weimar and you see the word uh, Weimar. The graphic expression was very innovative. Uh, here was, uh, you know, Walter Gropius, the founder. This is a quotation from Walter Gropius. Only work which is the product of inner compulsion can have spiritual meaning. And my question to you is, when we do a project today, do we think of its spiritual meaning? Because I think the very word spiritual is missing in our language, but it didn't miss, was not absent in the discourse of Walter Gropius. As you can see, only work which is the product of inner compulsion can have spiritual meaning. And this is about the truth of creativity. You start from the inside. In a way, from your soul, from your inner being. And, 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 and if there is truth there and it is expressed, you achieve a spiritual meaning. Uh, this is an early work by uh, uh, Walter Gropius only to show that, that 
initially he was an expressionist uh, architect with uh, you know sculptural tendencies at least in this work uh, is very obvious johannes eaton a uh, professor he uh, gropius uh, you know fired after a while after some years two or three years and but he was very loved by uh, stu the students and uh, here he is you know in uh, in a mystical uh, posturing he was also he also brought to the bauhaus uh, you know a, a special uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, i don't know if i can call it training uh, maybe it was a training too must does not and uh, you know his attire and even the way he shaved himself and so on it was about the, about mysticism and the students loved it and they they celebrated together in this must does non fashion in 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 various ways he was uh, teaching color or about color within the school and it's my opinion that when johannes eaton left and maybe gropius thought that um, the school was to evolve more towards technology and towards the the imperatives of of, of 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 the time, and maybe someone like Johannes Eaton was a little bit uh, oriented towards uh, other gods, so to speak, and the mysticism of Johannes Eaton was probably considered by Gropius at the time uh, a little bit problematic. They, I think the Bauhaus lost something when Johannes Eaton left. Lionel Feininger, this is the man who. Uh, as I said, he was North American, but uh, uh, um, German ancestry, and, and he created that um, uh, woodcut with the Cathedral of Socialism, which accompanied the text of the Manifesto by Walter Gropius. Uh, here it is. And here is a painting by Lionel Feininger. another painting by him. Gerhard Marx, uh, he was a sculptor. Uh, again, at the beginning, the Bauhaus didn't have architects, with the exception of Walter Gropius, who, as we talked about before, um, only studied architecture for four semesters in a school. And, uh, and then he became the founder of, of, of the Bauhaus, well, he did other things, and we are going to talk about him in detail in the, in the, in the next presentation. But this is uh, Gerhard Marx, the sculptor in the school. He was a uh, teaching sculpture. Uh, and um, you, know, you see, his sculpture was not abstract, but it had expression. It was, uh, it, 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 I wouldn't call him an expressionist uh, sculptor. But uh, although he was a figurative uh, sculptor, he, you know, the, the emotionalism of, of expression was, uh, was there for all to see. Vasily Kandinsky, the great uh, Russian prince, he was a prince and a major force in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in painting, in, in modern painting. Uh, he even wrote a book uh, about the spiritual in art. Uh, and this is a painting by ba Vasily Kandinsky, and this is another painting by Vasily Kandinsky. He taught in the Bauhaus, and so did uh, his good friend uh, Paul Klee, and we are going to talk a little bit about him too. Paul Klee, whom I admire a lot. Here he was, unfortunately he died at 60, a very sensitive man, a very intelligent man, and a great... Uh, I think a great, a great professor, a great teacher, a great pedagogue, because you can find on the web uh, his uh, notes books with you know his um, preparations for the courses he taught, and he was like Leonardo da Vinci, extremely capable of uh, uniting disparate fields and with an immense curiosity for uh, you know art for life for science for biology for medicine for whatever in painting he was uh, ineffable he, he was uh, you know he's considered a great poet in painting and he was indeed 
Miss Van der Rohe, who, uh, you know, you, you, you know his architecture in his apartment in Chicago, had on the walls small paintings by Paul Klee. And you could say, what's the relationship between the paintings of Paul Klee and Miss Van der Rohe? Well, maybe this shows uh, the affection Miss Van der Rohe had for uh, a certain kind of art, which in some ways, was different from the appearance of his architecture. Paul Klee, Paul Klee. Günther Stolz, she was the, 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 the leader, the, she was the director of the textile department, the only lady who ran a department within the school, and I appreciate her a lot. Günther Stolz, she was, uh, uh, a remarkable lady. She was the one who took her hat off on that picture uh, on the terrace of the building uh, of the Bauhaus. Here she was. And, uh, you know, uh, still the uh, women are connected with textiles. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think textiles are very noble. It's a very noble art form. And... Uh, I would say in, in favor, in praise actually of, of, of uh, uh, textiles is that the, all the goddesses of uh, weaving were actually women. And uh, weaving is about uh, textile work. These are some, uh, some of her works. This one. Uh, but there, were, there was another lady, uh, the, uh, Miss um, Albers, uh, the wife of Joseph Albers, who also taught, or he was, I'm not sure if he wasn't initially a student in the Bauhaus and then became a master. His wife also uh, worked in the, and maybe she led also at one point the textile department. But the ladies uh, took care of this, um, uh, of this art form, which is unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, a little bit... Uh, and not considered as highly as it should be. Let us say at this point that even Le Corbusier had tapestries. There are tapestries designed by Le Corbusier. And I think the fact that the word architect and architecture includes in its, um, uh, in the very word includes texture, which comes from text, which means to weave. So. Textile work, weaving, is part of the, of the very essence, even of architecture. Now, this is Oskar Schlemmer, whom I already uh, expressed admiration towards. Uh, I, I value a lot Oskar Schlemmer. He designed the, the logo of the, of the school, but he also created uh, unbelievable uh, stage designs and uh, choreography uh, like, like here. When I said that the Bauhaus was able to unite play with work, here is an example. This is what free people can do if the, if the imagination is stirred up and encouraged. I mean, this image is innovative even for our time. And it was, you know, uh, taken uh, about 100 years ago. You, you know, it's a pleasure. It's a great pleasure to see students and masters working together to create a new art form uh, to, to, to honor creativity with the, 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 the utmost intensity and to unite, as I said, uh, work with, with, uh, with play. Uh, the creative work, the creative spirit of the Bauhaus is, is still uh, moving, is still uh, a great source of inspiration, I would say. Again and again, they wanted to change the world, nothing less. They wanted to create the new. They wanted to unite sculpture and painting and the, all the other arts with architecture and to contribute la in a way la uh, to, to a rebirth of the world. Because let's not forget, in 1919, when, when the Bauhaus was founded, it was just one year after the deadly First World War ended. So it was a quest for a new beginning, for humanity in general. Now we have the deadly and, and maddening war in Ukraine. 
maybe this could make us also desire a new beginning to transcend, to, to remove words from our lives. Unfortunately, madmen like the one who provoked the war, the war in Ukraine still continue to think that in quest for new lands, hundreds of thousands of people can die and maybe should die. This is the conception of Sikh leaders. But look what the artists do. In their fragility, they give to human beings source of joy and uh, a desire to aspire towards a better world. And here is Oscar Schlemmer. Bravo to him. Marcel Breuer, who was initially a student, he left Hungary to go to study in Germany at the Bauhaus, and then he became a master there. And, uh, and then he had a flourishing activity in the United States, uh, first uh, together with um, the Walter Gropius and then uh, by himself. Here he was, a handsome and interesting young uh, Hungarian. This is the Kandinsky chair. It's called the Kandinsky. Initially, it was called differently. It was. It is called the Kandinsky chair because Vasily Kandinsky, his colleague in the school, loved the chair so much. So he made a new one, you know, like uh, homemade, uh, handmade for Vasily. And in time, I think a, a, a collector or a manufacturer renamed it. Initially, it was named differently. Renamed it the Vasily chair or the Kandinsky chair. It's a very famous chair designed by Marcel Breuer. And this is a building he built in the United States in the exposed concrete. He, he, he was a remarkable architect, uh, Marcel Breuer, and a remarkable uh, designer. This is, for example, the Whitney Museum of American Art in Manhattan, in New York City, designed by Marcel Breuer. Born in Hungary, educated at the Bauhaus, arrived in the United States, and this is one example of his works. You see, it, it, it moves me continuously when I contemplate the lives and the creations of these people. It's immensely beneficial when a school warms up the souls of the students, encourages them to be imaginative, creative, even crazily so if you want, and look at the effects. They change the world. Laszlo Moholinog, another Hungarian who uh, uh, was a significant force of the Bauhaus. Uh, he had some training or he even graduated in the law school, but instead of becoming a lawyer, he became an artist. He was uh, he produced uh, remarkable works in photography, but uh, also created mobiles. And he became the director of the Chicago Bauhaus because when when the Bauhaus activity ended in Germany in 1933, some of <clears throat> some of the of the people from the Bauhaus uh, crossed the ocean in, in the United States. And in Chicago, there was the, the, the Chicago Bauhaus created, run. I mean, he was the director of the school, Laszlo Moholinov. And this is a you know, photo of, uh, you know, hybrid work, uh, photographic work, which shows again a beautiful transgression of limitations and a beautifully fresh new spirit. And we need this. Without it, we, we, we become really... Uh, um, I don't know how to say, you know, it, it, it revolts me when I see that so many uh, young people do not have, um, you know, the enthusiasm for the art. They don't have the desire to change the world. They don't have the desire to create a new beginning for, for themselves and for, um, you know, society uh, at large. Laszlo Moholinak. Look, look, good works, good works which are still very fresh and very modern in the good sense of the word. Miss van der Rohe, who became the third director of the school after Hans Meyer, so initially was um, Walter Gropius from 1919 to, I don't know, 1925, 1926. Then for three years, it was Hans Meyer and then Miss van der Rohe in the last years. And then the, the school closed under the directorship of Miss van der Rohe. Uh, himself, 
like Walter Gropius, no schooling in architecture. But they didn't need schooling because they were born architects. Uh, this is an early work by him, uh, rather unexpected, uh, considering the, you know, the typical, so-called typical Nis van der Rohe um, uh, monument to Rosa Luxemburg, uh, and uh, you know, a remarkable work, uh, cubistic as it is in brick. And now this is the, the you know, the crown hall in Chicago one of the most famous buildings he built in Chicago. So after he crossed the ocean into the United States, and this is where the, the Illinois Institute of Technology is, the School of Architecture of the Illinois Institute of Technology is in this very building, which I had a chance to see. And I remember once I was invited to be part of a jury uh, to evaluate the works of the students. And when I left in the evening, the sunlight, it was um, uh, uh, reaching this uh, platform uh, just before the, uh, the steps, uh, the entrance steps into the building. And I had them, I, I regret I, don't I didn't have a camera with me because it was something magical. This became this platform, this, this part of the building became like an altar. Uh, reddened and uh, uh, reddened by the by the by the light of the west beneath the the setting sun, it was it was truly magical. Anyway, so you know this uh, uh, building by him, uh, very famous. Also, unfortunately, flooded from time to time. And uh, why am I saying this, showing this? This is by Johannes Sitten. I am I am showing just some images from the produce the graphics produced in, in, in the Bauhaus. Um, you see here, Eaton Fest. It's, uh, I don't know German, but uh, uh, we also see the word Spiel, which means uh, play. So Eaton Fest, festival, Spiel, um, uh, play. Uh, they, they, it, it was an unbelievable spirit there. They, it was a continuous creativity every single day. And look at them here, you know. This is what you get when you have freedom, freedom of expression. Art is about freedom. Art is not about dogma and strict rules and regulations. It's about freedom. This school was magical. It was truly magical. And, and, and these pictures still move me a lot. And I'm sure they move others as well. Again, uh, Oscar Schlemmer. Look at them. Here you have professors and students together. Schlemmer is here in the center. Aren't they beautiful? I think they are. I only hope they can inspire us. Inspire us to, uh, towards a different kind of architecture, towards a different kind of education in architecture and in art, and uh, uh, towards a, a different kind of school. Here they are again together. A small group of people, this was not a very large school. But you, you can tell, looking backwards, that they were animated by, by an enthusiasm that was, uh, was and still is intoxicating. Oscar Schlemmer, a world has been destroyed. We must seek a radical solution. This is what Walter Gropius wrote in 1918 when the First World War ended. I wonder if we shouldn't also uh, search for a radical solution because the world is collapsing because of mad wars, because of the climate change problems, because of the rising levels of the seas, because of the melting of the icebergs. So we need a fresh new start. The final goal of all artistic activity is architecture. This is what he wrote in, uh, in the Bauhaus Manifesto in 1919. Look at them, didn't I say that uh, they try to uh, combine play with work? Well, here is an example. In fact, we don't see the work, we only see the play. But, but this playing was, was an intrinsic part of the creativity that uh, the Bauhaus was able to achieve. And I take this picture almost like a symbol. What, what, what the effects of freedom are, on artistic uh, uh, activity, because it needs to exuberance, it needs to uh, 
exaltation. He needs to this energy, and without this energy, we cannot create anything. Oscar Schlemmer. Oscar Schlemmer. That's it. So I stop here about the Bauhaus. Let's have a short, uh, a short discussion, if you want.